let, let me welcome everybody uh, to our afternoon meeting um, for our annual lecture series. I am so delighted um, to be able to introduce a dear old colleague and friend of mine, uh, Dr. Joel Howell, uh, who will be giving today's talk. Uh, jo Joel Howell is an MD, PhD, uh, a professor at the University of Michigan in the departments of internal medicine at the medical school in health management and policy at the Michigan School of Public Health and in, in the Department of History uh, at the College of Literature, Science, and the Arts. Uh, Joel is also the Elizabeth Farron Professor of the History of Medicine. Uh, Joel received his MD here at the University of Chicago, uh, stayed, stayed with us at the, in, at, at the U of C for his internship and residency in internal medicine. Um, uh, he then went on to the University of Pennsylvania. But before I tell you about that, uh, I do want to say that in the 1970s, uh, I, I was one of the few, if not only, medical ethicists here at the University of Chicago. And I was doing um, uh, ethics consultations and also teaching students and residents uh, about ethics. And in 1980-81, I got an NIH award to go to the University of Virginia for the year. And I looked for who could replace me, uh, who could replace me as someone who could do ethics consultations and ethics teaching. And the best person was the senior resident, Dr. Joel Howell. And so in 1980-81, or was it 81-82, Joel? 81 uh, 82 81-82. Joel took over for me for the year that I was away at Virginia and ran the ethics program here at the university. Uh, then I came back and Joel went off to the University of Pennsylvania as a Robert Wood Johnson clinical scholar, and he got his PhD there at UPenn in the history and sociology of science. Uh, Joel Howell has been a faculty member at the University of Michigan since 1984. He's the senior associate director of the University of Michigan's National Clinician Scholars Program. He's written widely on the uses of medical technology, examining the social and contextual factors relevant to clinical application and diffusion, and analyzing why American medicine has become obsessed with the use of medical technology. Joel is a co-founder and director of the Medical Arts Program, a program founded by the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation to use the arts to help make medical students and residents become better docs. Dr. Howell's current research is an attempt to analyze the implication for health policy of factors that have been contributed to and slowed the diffusion of medical technology into clinical practice using both a sociology of knowledge and a comparative approach. Uh, Joel's research has been recently supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Investigator Award in Health Policy Research and by the Burroughs Welcome Foundation Award in the History of Medicine. Among Joel's many books along the way um, is an old book called Technology in American Medical Practice, 1880 to 1930, um, written in the late 1980s, uh, a book called Medical Lives in Scientific Medicine at Michigan, 1891 to 1969, published by the University of Michigan Press. Um, a book on technology in the hospital, transforming patient care uh, in the early 20th century, published by Johns Hopkins University Press. Uh, a book about riding bikes, Washington County bike rides, a guide to road rides in and road rides in and around Ann Arbor published in 2009, and his most recent book, The History of the University of Michigan Medical School at its Bicentennial, also published by the University of Michigan Press in 2017. 
Joel, it's a delight to welcome you back to the University of Chicago, even if it's only for a couple of hours. Joel. Well, it's a delight to be there, and I wish I really was there. Um, thank you for that very kind introduction. I must continue to toot my horn by pointing out that the guide to road rides in and around Washtenaw County, the bicycling book, is the definitive guide to road riding in Washtenaw County. I can say that with some authority because it's, it is the only guide to, do, to road riding. Um, Mark, just a personal note. Um, Mark's been a, a trailblazer for all of us in so many ways. Um, we could think about what it means to have a senior resident uh, running the medical ethics program at the University of Chicago in 1981 and how far we have come since then. Uh, and Mark, is, on, on a very personal level, you've been a role model to me. Um, I believe you are the first uh, person to achieve a promotion and a tenured position in a major department of internal medicine with research that was explicitly in the humanities and social sciences. And in, so, in doing that, you, you really set the stage for many of us, including myself, who have come after you so that we don't have to we, we have somebody we can point to that says you don't have to get NIH R01 grants in order to be to deserve tenure in a, in a department. So thank you for, for doing that. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about today uh, is the human radiation experiments. And I'm going to do the traditional screen. Uh, where are we? There we are. Okay. By radiation experiments, I mean human experiments having to do with radiation uh, that took place during the Second World War and the Cold War. Uh, unlike many, if not most, of the canonical historical examples of human experimentation um, that are more frequently remembered, these were a heterogeneous group of experiments done by various people in various places. They all had in common some attention to the curious phenomenon of radioactivity and the fact so dramatically demonstrated here over Japan in August of 1945, twice, uh, that it can be used for military purposes. Now to make sense of these experiments, we need to set the stage. We need to talk about science before and during World War II. We have to talk about the fact that World War II was a science-based war we have to understand the development of big science, big federally supported science that was in a very direct way, a precursor to the wonderful world of NIH funding that we all enjoy today. And the idea of research during wartime when an apocalyptic, apocalyptic ending uh, to the world was a very real possibility. Uh, what I'm gonna talk in the, doing this talk is start with by talking about technology uh, in the First and the Second World War. I'm gonna talk about physical technology, biological technology. And then after a while, I'm gonna pivot and sketch some of the experiments that were done and raise some questions we might want to think about. Now, it's really apropos in a, in a strange and ironic and sad way to be giving this talk at the University of Chicago. Uh, it's ironic and sad because unsurprisingly, I'm actually in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, and whether or not we're really at Chicago, I'll leave to the philosophers in the group. Um, but you'll see that the University of Chicago plays a key role, uh, both in the overall history and in the human experiments we're going to be talking about in, in very, very many ways. Now, let's start early in the 20th century. Uh, the First World War had given us new and unprecedented ways of killing human beings and producing incredible harm with uh, industrial efficiency, things like tanks and barbed wire, also poison gas, uh, the early use of airplanes. Uh, and all of this, these things had to be invented by somebody. But after the war ended, there wasn't a lot of attention to doing uh, really systematic research for military needs. It was what the work that was done was small scale, it was unfunded, um, it was uncoordinated. And the story of radar uh, illustrates this point. Um, after playing only a bit role in the First World War, air power was becoming increasingly important as a means of waging war. Uh, planes fly, 
high up in the sky. Uh, they go really fast. They can carry things that kill people. And the biggest problem if people are flying planes against you is how to know that they're coming before they're right over your head and dropping bombs on them. So in 1930, people working in the Naval Research Laboratory noticed that passing planes reflected back radio waves from the ground and figured out you could deduce the distance. You could use what you call radio detection and ranging or radar as a means of finding out when planes were heading at you. Now, there was not much cooperation between the military services. The Army only found out about this by accident when someone happened to visit the laboratory. And there wasn't much in the way of resources to do anything with this new technology. In 1939, Nazi Germany invaded Poland and the First, Second World War started. Uh, France and the UK promptly declared war on Germany. The United States followed a couple of years later. Everybody knew at the beginning of this war that it was gonna be a science-based war, much more so than other wars had been. People saw this coming. And how are we gonna deal with that? How are we gonna organize the science? Well, in the United States, uh, a gentleman named Vannevar Bush, uh, no relation to either of the President Bushes, uh, was made the head of OSRD, the Office of Scientific Research and Development. Uh, the New York Times dubbed him the czar of research. And he thus became in charge of a civilian organization that was supposed to coordinate research activity that was government sponsored, primarily for the military. This was a fundamentally new idea that the government should get intimately involved in doing scientific research. It was a new idea in that suddenly there was a scale possible that you could say, I want all these people to work together and we have resources to fund it. So if we go back to our old friend radar, it was not hard to figure out that radar was going to be important. The question then arose, where should we put the laboratories? Where should we do the research? And previously these debates in Congress had come to an impasse. Uh, in the House of Representatives, Massachusetts has more votes than Montana. And so they'd say, let's put it in Massachusetts. In the Senate, Montana has exactly the same number of votes as Massachusetts. They would say, well, if, we're gonna, if the government is gonna support research, it should distribute it evenly around the country. And the end result was the government didn't support a lot of research outside of its own labs. Along came the Second World War. And with respect to Montana, there wasn't a lot of science going on in Montana, but there was in Massachusetts and the MIT, or Massachusetts Institute of Technology, uh, set up the radar lab. They were extraordinarily successful. It had an enormous impact on the war. A couple of examples, uh, as you are may remember from your history lessons, uh, after the war started, uh, Germany wanted to invade Britain. Goring promised that the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, could smash the British air defenses, he said, in four days. Uh, Germany had a lot more planes than Britain did, uh, but Britain had radar. And the radar could tell them when the German planes were taking off across the channel. And Britain survived, which surprised a hell of a lot of people, including many in the United States. It was also terribly effective in, in, out in the Atlantic Ocean as well. Uh, the wartime effort depended upon shipping things across the Atlantic. Submarines could go undersea and were extraordinarily disruptive. They were hard to find, but with radar, you could see subs coming two to five miles away. How effective were they? Well, this chart gives you one example. Um, I'll just say that between January and February of 1942, without radar, Allied forces managed to attack precisely four submarines in 8,000 hours of patrol. The first night out with the radar device, they were able to detect three U-boats and sink one. Its importance grew over the course of the war. And I think there's really great truth to say these are two lessons from radar that big organized wartime research could make a difference. And somebody else said the atomic bomb only ended the war, radar won it. And I think there's some truth to that. Lots of other research in the physical sciences going on, uh, research in computing. Uh, here you see early computing research going on, operations research. Uh, improved productivity, uh, U.S. merchant vessels that took 35 weeks to build before the war were being launched in 50 days by 1943. 
Uh, this is uh, the 1944 Willow Run facility just down the road from where I'm sitting, produced 5,500 bombers per year. Uh, and this played an important part in winning the war that, because the Nazis were just not as fast uh, in high volume manufacturing. So this led to the idea, again, the wartime research is important and it deserves having a lot of resources thrown at it. Let's talk about biological research and human experimentation. Mustard gas was one of the most feared weapons of the First World War. There were fears that it would be widely used in the Second World War. Uh, mustard gas is species specific, so you can't use animal models. And they did so-called man break experiments to see what it would take to break a man. They would put people in the chambers with gas and not let them out until they passed out, even if they really asked to come out sooner and try different clothing and poison gas masks. Um, this is an ethics talk. You may wonder if they were volunteers. Um, they were encouraged to volunteer. And as this quote says, occasionally there have been individuals or groups who did not cooperate fully. A short explanatory talk and a slight verbal dressing down was always successful. Uh, but bear in mind that prisoners and conscientious objectors who were the subjects in many of these experiments uh, were staying home. While many of their friends and relatives and colleagues were overseas, this was not a war where you rotated overseas, you stayed overseas until you died or the war ended. Uh, I'll also point out that mustard gas, of course, was an early chemotherapeutic agent, then there were experiments being done on it with some modest success. Epidemic diseases, always a big problem in time of war. Venereal disease, penicillin had been discovered in the 1930s, but was not widely available. Uh, OSRD controlled access to penicillin for clinical trials and also controlled protocols and how it could be used. Uh, there were experiments done in this country. Uh, people talked about doing experiments of intentionally inoculating people with gonorrhea and then testing to see if you could treat it. Some of these were done here at the federal prison in Terre Haute, Indiana. Um, there was attention paid to the ethics of these experiments. The chair of the Committee on Medical Research, A.N. Richards, in 1942 said that volunteers should only be utilized as subjects and only after the risks have been fully explained and after science statements have been obtained. Um, this is a memo that he wrote, but it was a top secret memo. So I'll leave it to you to mull over whether or not an ethical dictum that is top secret is really uh, an ethical dictum. Um, you've heard from Susan Reverby, who's, who did pathbreaking research on the fact that after the war, the same people who wanted to do this in Terre Haute went down to Guatemala and did similar kinds of research. Other biological research was important. Malaria, huge problem in the war. North Africa and Sicily and the Pacific Theater. Uh, some people called it the biggest medical problem of the war. And it raised interesting medical, medical ethical issues, not least because um, a lot of the work was done on prisoners. Uh, this image is from a malaria ward at Stateville Penitentiary in Illinois, just south of Chicago. They delayed doing these experiments so that a Life magazine photographer uh, could be on hand when this prisoner was uh, allowed to be bitten by mosquitoes carrying malaria. And this image and the point came back up again at the Nuremberg trials on the question of whether or not prisoners could in fact give informed consent to experimentation. Uh, one of those prisoners has a very famous connection with the University of Chicago. Uh, Nathan Leopold was a University of Chicago student uh, who, together with his buddy Loeb, decided to murder a 14-year-old child in Hyde Park just because they were curious to see what it was like to see somebody die. But that's another University of Chicago story for another time. As important as medical research was, it was not the centerpiece of World War II research. The centerpiece was physics and physicists. And this is a statue that stands, as I hope many of you recognize it, it stands not far from where we would be gathered, where we're gathering in person in Hyde Park. Physicists became the elite scientists. Daniel Kevlis has a wonderful book called The Physicists that talks about this. They benefited from the kind of large scale research that was being, that I mentioned earlier, 
and doubtless the most famous in, impactful event um, was the invention of the atomic bomb. Now in the 1930s, there was a lot of interest in nuclear physics. And in fact, the most dramatic scientific event of 1939 was the splitting of the uranium nucleus. Uh, this was done in Germany. Germany arguably had the very best physicists in the universe uh, in Germany. And people started mulling about whether or not the energy that was released um, could be used to make a bomb. Nobody knew, it wasn't clear. Uh, Einstein, of course, who had theorized E equals MC squared, which talks about the amount of energy that could be released, was alarmed about the possibilities of building a bomb. And he wrote to President Roosevelt, who started the Manhattan Project, uh, which we'll talk about in a second. But nobody knew if it could be done, where it could be done, how you could separate the events. There's a wonderful play called Copenhagen by Michael Frayn, F-R-A-Y-N, which explores Heisenberg, arguably the most brilliant physicist of the 20th century, uh, visiting with Niels Bohr in Copenhagen and discussing whether or not one could build an atomic bomb. He then went back to Germany and told Hitler that it wasn't possible to build an atomic bomb, that the physics just wouldn't work. And we do not know to this day whether he made a, a mistake. Even the best physicist in the world can make a mistake. Um, or if he foresaw uh, what would happen if Nazi Germany got an atomic bomb. Um, many historians have tried to figure this out, I think so far unsuccessfully. It's a wonderful, wonderful play. I highly recommend it to you. But the play is one thing, reality is another. And now we must turn once again uh, to the University of Chicago and to Stagg Field, uh, being built here in 1927. Uh, University of Chicago football has a gloried and storied, if not terribly long, history. Those of you who don't know, the very first Heisman Trophy winner uh, played for the University of Chicago. Uh, the University of Chicago is a founding member of the Big Ten. Uh, it left in 1946. Uh, Michigan State um, was added in 1949 to make it a Big Ten, and we now have 12 members, and I'll leave to another day how the, come the Big Ten has 12 people, but that's, that's life. The University of Chicago presidency was not known for being that excited about the importance of exercise. He once commented that when I feel like exercising, I lie down until the feeling goes away. Uh, Stag Field uh, eventually fell into disrepair. And you all know the area of Stagg Field because this is the Regenstein Library sketch on top of where Stagg Field was. And the Moore sculpture sits over here. However, when it was still a stadium, a major stadium, it was the site for arguably one of the most significant events of the 20th century in any field bar done. And that's a strong statement, but I think it's defensible. People decided that if we were going to study nuclear, whether or not you could build a bomb, the work should be done at the University of Chicago, in part because of the excellent academics and facilities, in part, frankly, because it wasn't on the coast and was thus a little safer from attack by enemy forces. And in 1942, people gathered uh, at one of the old squash courts uh, under the under Stag Field uh, to examine a pile, what they it was called a pile, it was a pile of alternating graphite like layers and uranium pellets. Uh, I've always liked the fact that this was a squash court they worked on. Um, some of you uh, may know that Mark uh, Siegler uh, was an excellent, excellent squash player in his day. Um, I played against him many, many times. Mark, you were a very irritating player to play against. And when your opponent says you're irritating, that usually means it's that because I couldn't figure out how to beat you, which I found very irritating. Um, Mark's a left-handed guy. He, he only had two shots, lobs and drop shots, uh, which basically meant you were spending the entire time running to the front and back of the court and eventually got tired and gave up. But that's, an, again, another story. Here on the squash courts of the University of Chicago Stag Field, again, not far from where you're sitting, so those of you who are in Hyde Park, um, 
people tried to see if you could actually create a self-sustaining nuclear reaction. If the laws of physics permitted the creation of energy that would keep going <clears throat> from a nuclear reaction. Of course, the other question is once you start this, re this, this chain reaction going, can you stop it? And I'm gonna come back to this apocalyptic fear a couple of times, but people were genuinely scared. This was a new, a new world. They'd never been there before. And one of the uh, leading physicists uh, who loved to eat and loved, and loved dining once commented uh, when he was asked why he had dinner twice the night before this experiment, he said, we have an experiment we're gonna to run tomorrow. Chances are it won't work, but there's a remote chance it'll work too well. And that's why I'm having a second dinner tonight. And I don't think he was totally joking about that. December the 2nd, 1942, cold day in Chicago, 10 degrees. There was no photographer present. This is a sketch of what somebody thought it looked like. They gradually withdrew the control rods and the count, neutron counter started to increase. They said they sounded like crickets and the power went critical, meaning it, it started a reaction that would have been self-sustaining. Uh, they then put the, the rods back in and uh, somebody handed Fermi a bottle of Chianti in a brown paper bag. He sent a coded message out saying the Italian nav navigator has just landed in the new world. The question came back, how are the natives? And he said, very friendly. I haven't emphasized, I should have, how super secret this was. Let's, 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 let's just bear in mind, this is 1942. We're in the middle of a world war. It's unclear who's going to win the war. We're afraid that German, Germany has the best physicists in the world. They could be working on a bomb as well. The last thing, we, you know, if, if we're successful and they know we're successful, then they'll know they can go ahead and push forward. This was all done ultra super secret world. At the University of Chicago, people interested in the bomb got together and formed the Metrological Laboratory or MetLab, that was a coded name. As many as 2000 people spread across campus. It eventually became the first federal laboratory, uh, Argonne National Laboratory. Uh, this shows people who are present uh, here at the chain reaction gathered together outside Eckert Hall at the University of Chicago, which was one of the sites for the Met Lab and is now the location of the Department of Mathematics. Uh, there were people in this group, Robert Stone uh, from the medical school, I don't know who he is in this picture, um, was involved and, we, and was the, and we'll get back to him with the radiation experiments. But the action now moved to Los Alamos, north of Albuquerque, 7,500 feet up. And this is where people got together to build the bomb. There were as many as eight Nobel laureates sitting around having dinner together. They cooked on electric hot plates because wood burning stoves didn't work. Scientists in the military had to learn how to work with each other. Something was new. Um, they had basically any resources they wanted. So this is big science, ultra secret science. And at Almogardo, New Mexico on July 16th, 1945, uh, the first nuclear bomb was exploded. There was serious concern that this was gonna cause a rift in the physics of the universe, that it would spread uncontrollably around the world. And that would basically be the end of the world. Nobody, nobody had any idea what was gonna happen when you actually exploded an atomic bomb. It obviously did not cause the end of the world, literally in that sense. Um, and the question was then what to do with it. The war was working its way across the Pacific Ocean, Iwo Jima, Took, us, took the United States four weeks to win the war, 30,000 US servicemen died. Okinawa took 12 weeks, 50,000 US servicemen died, 90,000 Japanese troops died, 100,000 civilians died. Those are horrible numbers. And people thought this was a dress rehearsal uh, for the invasion of Japan, which was just gonna be a whole lot worse. I'm mentioning this because we have, there's a lot of debate now about whether or not to drop the bomb, whether we should have dropped the bomb or done a demonstration over a Pacific Island. The problem with that is we weren't sure that the second bomb would work. We'd only done this once. Who knows if the second one's gonna work? At the time, 
it was not that much of a debate. President Roosevelt had died in April of 1945. President Truman had seen the wages of war firsthand in World War I. He wanted unconditional surrender. Uh, it's telling about the secrecy that President Truman, the Vice President Truman, when he was Vice President, had not known about the Manhattan Project. It had been kept secret from the, from the Vice President of the United States. Um, but when he found about it, found out about it, he appointed a committee and said, use it as fast as possible and without any advance warning whatsoever. On August the 6th, 1945, the Enola Gay, it's the name of an airplane, dropped a bomb over Hiroshima. 350,000 people lived in Hiroshima before the Enola Gay flew over it, 140,000 of them died. This is what Hiroshima looked like after the explosion. This is Nagasaki, the second bomb. The top shows before the bomb hit, the bottom shows after the bomb hit. These numbers are horrific. I should point out, by the way, that not totally unprecedented. Tokyo had been bombed with conventional weapons and 80 to 130,000 people had died. Uh, Dresden was firebombed and about 100,000 people died. Uh, Kurt Vonnegut, by the way, has a wonderful book called Slaughterhouse Five. It's not wonderful. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a powerful book about being in Dresden uh, during the firebombing. World War II was different in that civilians were targeted more. And during the First World War, 90% of the people who died were military. During the Second World War, 60% were military and 40% were civilians. So the war comes to an end. And the question is now, what do we do? Many scientists said we need to make the information public. They said the laws, the monopoly is not gonna last and the laws of nature are available to anyone. Uh, the United States and the Soviet Union had won the war as allies. We often forget that we were allies during the second world war. They formed a commission as to what we should do about nuclear weapons. The United States said we should have a comprehensive evaluation should have on-site inspections, and then we would relinquish our arsenal of nuclear arms and scientific information. The Soviet Union said we, they wanted an immediate ban on manufacture and use of atomic weapons. <clears throat> the United States said the Soviets were asking the United States to give up, up its monopoly for a promise. Uh, the Soviets said the United States was asking them to reveal the state of their research before we gave up our weapons and the commission came to nothing. Thus ended one war and started another, the Cold War. I'm gonna spend a few minutes giving the setting of the Cold War before we shift to the experiments that went on. The Soviet Union, of course, got an atomic bomb, 1949. They got a hydrogen, we got a hydrogen bomb in 1952, the Soviets got one in 1953. And in this competition, which was again, science-based, uh, the Soviets appeared to jump ahead with Sputnik 1 in 1957. A huge prestige jump for what had previously been seen as a backward state. They claimed this meant that they were the best system because they were able to put satellites in orbit around the earth. Next, they sent up Sputnik 2. This time they had a dog. Uh, the dog didn't come back by the way. Uh, but the point is if they could send up a dog around the world, around the, the world, they could send up anything, including a bomb. The United States said, we could, we'll do it too. And on December 6th, we tried to launch a missile from Cape Canaveral and it failed miserably. So things were not going well in the Cold War. The Cuban Missile Crisis came in 1962. The Soviets put uh, missiles in Cuba, 42 medium range missiles, placing most of the United States under direct threat. They could hit the United States in six minutes coming across 234 miles to Miami. Uh, we went very, very close to an all out war. Uh, on a personal level, I was living in Columbus, Mississippi, uh, outside of a strategic air command base. Maybe the culmination is this Titan II missile. This, every warhead this missile had was 600 times as powerful as the one that landed on Hiroshima. They were around Wichita, Little Rock, and Tucson. Each Titan warhead had 18 
warheads, and there, excuse me, they had six warheads, and there were 18 of them. They could be launched from inside of a silo. Uh, people turned the keys. The people who launched them didn't know where they were going. But the level of destruction was nearly unimaginable. Uh, the Soviet Union tested a bomb in 1961 that could have a yield of 100 million tons, 100 megatons of TNT. That is 3,300 times as powerful as the bomb that killed people at Hiroshima, that killed 100,000 people at Hiroshima. This constant attempt to build more and more powerful weapons was reflected in a number of ways, one of which was in popular media. Uh, if you haven't seen Dr. Strangelove, you should, um, because it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful way to evoke the meaning of the Cold War. When I teach this to my, uh, to talk about the radiation experiments to my undergraduates, I have them watch Dr. Strangelove. And here you see the guy riding the bomb down. They offered this role to John Wayne who turned it down. How to survive a nuclear attack became part of common parlance. This is a brochure that was sent out for how to survive an atomic attack. Don't rush right outside right after a bombing. That sounds like a good sense idea. Meanwhile, jump into a trench or any other convenient depression in the ground if you're in a yard when the bomb explodes. This was what I was taught in elementary school. This is the world we lived in. People built fallout shelters, air filters, air exhaust plumbing. So when the whole world is going to hell on top of you, you could survive. And people built these things and they stocked these things. And one of the ethical questions was if you got room for you know, your four family members to exists for six weeks and your neighbor comes and knocks on the door, what should you let him in? The point was during the Cold War, the threat of nuclear annihilation was always there. And in that context, let's turn and talk about the human radiation experiments. We're gonna go back up to the mountains of Los Alamos. Um, People were working with a new element called plutonium. It's named after Pluto. It should have been called plutonium, but Glenn Seaborg, who named it like the way plutonium sounded, so that's what it was called. He later got the Nobel Prize in chemistry and worked against nuclear bombs. We didn't know about the health effects. What did this do to people? We knew a little bit from radium. Uh, we used to have watches that would glow in the dark because of the radium on there. And there were women who took little, uh, things and licked, licked the, the paintbrushes and painted the radium on the dials. And they unfortunately came down with some fairly nasty diseases of radiation. So people knew that radiation exposure could cause disease. They didn't know what plutonium could do. They needed to find out because on August the 1st, 1944, this guy, a 23 year old chemist named Don Mastic a promising young graduate of the University of California, Berkeley, was working at Los Alamos with the entire supply of plutonium. It was rare, it was hard to make, it was unbelievably valuable. It was super secret. The word plutonium was secret. He was doing mouth pipetting. Laboratory scientists out there never do mouth pipetting. This is only one good reason. He was doing mouth pipetting and suddenly wound up with a bunch of plutonium in his mouth. He could taste the acid, he spit it out, he swished his mouth with a combination of chemicals designed to extract the plutonium. They pumped his stomach, they extracted as much as possible. And for weeks, he could make a radiation meter go nuts by just walking into a room and blowing out. We, were, we wanted to build bombs, we wanted to make more and more bombs, but we didn't know what happened to people when they ingested plutonium. They did work trying to find out at Los Alamos by measuring the amount that was excreted in the urine and still, but we didn't know how much they were taking in. So we didn't know what the kinetics were and we needed to find out. This is one set of radiation experiments. This is the set we're gonna spend the most time on. So we decided to go to places that had better hospital facilities. I keep saying we, because this is the United States government that's doing this. Um, places like Oak Ridge, Rochester, and the University of Chicago. They didn't expect acute short-term effects. Um, low doses, they had some experience, but they weren't sure about the long-term effects. 
if you want to do the, and, and they want us to know what would happen in people. So ethicists out there, just mull this question over as we go along. If you wanted to find out what happened to plutonium when people are exposed to it, who should be your subjects? And what, they should, what should they be told? Bear in mind that the word plutonium is super secret and we are living in the world that I've described to you in which an all out war with nuclear weapons seems like a very real possibility. People went to Oak Ridge where a 53 year old quote unquote colored man, that's how he was described, a cement worker named Ed Cabe was in the hospital after a motor vehicle accident. He was injected with plutonium. Uh, he wasn't told that he was being injected. The very word plutonium was classified. Uh, it was kind of a comedy of errors. They mixed up the before and after urine samples, so that didn't work. Uh, they took his bone and teeth and found out that it had gone into the bone. Um, in Rochester, they had a cyclotron, which made it easier to work with. And they gave people uranium at increasing doses until they got kidney damage. Here, metaphorically, at the University of Chicago, uh, they set up a series of questions they wanted to answer. And Robert Stone, who headed up the, the Biological Sciences Division of the UC Met Lab, wanted to know the answers to these questions. Uh, what are the first changes produced? Is peripheral blood an accurate measure? Can you recover completely? Are there ways to aid recovery? How much radiation does it take to kill somebody? Um, University of Chicago went on and did work on a number of people. Uh, there's a 68 year old man with cancer of the mouth and lung by the name of Arthur Hubbard, a businessman from the University from Austin, Texas. He was the first person injected 6.5 micrograms, code label CH1, Chicago first patient. And they collected his urine and stool, did similar work on a 55 year old woman with breast cancer and also on a young man with Hopkins, with Hodgkins. Uh, those last two got 95 micrograms. And what they learned was that the fecal ex, uh, excretion rate was lower for humans than it was for animals. And that's useful information. And in the early 1960s, uh, George Leroy, a name that might be known to some of you, um, this did some work on what happens when you ingest fallout. This, for this one, they, they said they did get informed consent. And they actually swept up nuclear fallout from Nevada, from atomic testing, and fed it to University of Chicago students and residents, and then studied to see how the radiation came through. Uh, other work was done at places like UCSF um, and others. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the, the work that was done at Cincinnati because it's particularly relevant. Mass General also did some similar work. Cincinnati was involved in, in, in total body radiation because people who were in the army had logical questions. What happens to people who are exposed to lots of radiation? You have 5,000 troops who have received 100 rads of radiation. Is it all right to reassemble these men and take them into combat? I don't know. They wanted to assess combat effectiveness. Could you still land a plane? How much exposure did it take to get you sick? Because if you knew how much exposure it took, you knew how much shielding would need to go on the plane that would affect how far the plane could fly, how much uh, bombs, a payload it could carry, or if you were going to build the nuclear po nuclear powered plane, which people were thinking about, what would the effects of radiation be? So what does it do to people when they get irradiated? When do you get nausea and vomiting? How long before it shows up in the bone marrow? Does it impair your ability to think? Does it impair your ability to do things? Can we take medication ahead of time? What about it being exposed to small repeated doses? And in Cincinnati, there were a number of experiments done using whole body irradiation uh, under contract with the Department of Defense. This could be argued as part of therapy for cancer, although people knew that it probably wasn't gonna work. Ironically, if you were gonna use whole body irradiation uh, on people who had cancer, um, you got better experimental results if you treated people whose tumors you knew were not going to be affected by the radiation because the army was really interested in what the effects of radiation were on normal tissue not on cancerous tissue people involved in these experiments were not given medications like antiemetics this would diminish the value of the experiments 
nor were they warned about any side effects because they didn't want to suggest them. Uh, 21 out of 90 people died in one month. Um, the problem with these experiments, of course, is that young healthy soldiers and sick patients with cancer don't respond in the same way to radiation or to much of anything else. Um, this eventually wound up in a lawsuit uh, and there's a plaque in the hospital denoting this with data that we still use today. These are some of the radiation experiments. I'm gonna to touch very lightly on a few more and then try to, and then come back to some general conclusions. Um, the Fernald State School in Massachusetts had children with developmental difficulties. They were fed radiation in their oatmeal uh, in order to see what the effects would be of ingesting radiation. Prisoners were used for a number of very important experiments. Um, we're gonna send people up into space. What are the effects of radiation? Um, they wanted to know, but they were particularly interested in the effects on testicular tissue. Uh, this was studied at the Oregon State Penitentiary as well as in Washington State. There are the so-called green run experiments also out of Washington State um, in which radiation was released into the atmosphere. We wanted to know what happens when radiation floats across the countryside. Uh, no better way to figure it out than to release the radiation ourselves and see what happens. I'm, I'm being, uh, I'll give you sources in a second. I know I'm being very brief. The point is that during this period, there was a lot of interest in radiation and a lot of different kinds of experiments being done. All done under secrecy. This is from the Washington site, protection for all, don't talk. Silence means security. And loose talk is a chain reaction for espionage. Now, for years, there were rumors about Americans being injected with plutonium. 1986 congressional report on America's nuclear guinea pigs got a little bit of attention, but really the person who deserves the most credit, I think, for breaking the story is a woman named Eileen Wilson. Uh, she was a reporter for the Albuquerque Tribune. Uh, she put names and faces to the story. And this is a book that I think is, has a lot of the essential information uh, in addition, there, there was a commission that was formed, the President's Commission on Human Radiation Experiments, formed in January of 1994 by Bill Clinton, who instructed government agencies to cooperate with them in studying the, the experiments. They were asked to decide who should receive monetary damages. Uh, in so doing, they addressed the question of retrospective ethical judgment, and I refer you to their chapter on retrospective ethical judgment because I think it's superb. Um, the report was released on October the 3rd, 1995. Those of you who are really, really good will know that October the 3rd, 1995 was also the day that the O.J. Simpson verdict came down. Uh, as a result, the O.J. Simpson verdict got a whole lot more attention than the release of this report. These reports all suffer from the inevitable problems of historical research, which is we need the data, we need the information, a lot of the questions you want to know the answers to, we just aren't there. The records weren't kept, or if they were kept, they, were, they weren't saved. <clears throat> so where do we, what does all this mean? I think we need to think about human experimentation and particularly the ethics of human experimentation as it confronted a whole new context. This was a context that simply did not exist prior to the Second World War. For one thing, this was a world war that affected everybody. It was a science-based war in a sense that other wars had not been. It was science-based in that everybody knew when the war started that the people who had the best science were probably gonna win the war. I have only scratched the surface of telling you about all the scientific work done in the Second World War. There was a, a lot more that we, didn't, that we didn't even mention. This then carried over into the Cold War, a potentially apocalyptic war, in which there were realistic concerns that the entire nation could be destroyed in a matter of a few minutes or an hour or so, in which secrecy was seen as a paramount virtue because we were attempting to conceal knowledge from the other side that would enable them 
This is a situation that was called MAD, MAD for Mutually Assured Destruction. The only reason it was thought, and it may be true, that we didn't blow the other side to smithereens is if we did, they would blow us to smithereens. And so we were each standing with a loaded gun and our finger on the trigger, but neither one was going to pull the trigger. Um, and the research that was done was seen as essential to maintaining that, that balance. Um, the other new things that happened here, this is big science. We now think that it's natural and inevitable that the federal government should support scientific research in non-federal facilities. We call it the NSF. We call it the National Institutes of Health, the University of Chicago, the University of Michigan, and many, many others around the country rely to a great extent on federal research dollars. These, this was not standard before the Second World War. It came directly out of this kind of um, of, of, of large-scale research. Finally, it was going on at multiple sites, unlike the one, a lot of historical medical experiments we talk about, which are a relatively limited number of sites. And finally, the fact that it was done by such a heterogeneous group of players suggests that at some level, the ethical norms permitted such research uh, to be done. And we can talk about whether or not it was ethical and what that means. Um, the details remain fuzzy for a lot of what happened. What's not fuzzy is the key role of the University of Chicago in so many of these steps. It's also not fuzzy the way in which these experiments presage much that is to come. So finally, medicine, the quest for knowledge, human experimentation always has to be looked at in a specific social, political, and economic context. I've tried to sketch out the context in which the human radiation experiments were done. Uh, I thank you for your attention and I would be happy to entertain questions. Dan. Did, did I see Deb Burnett uh, raising a question? No, I was just clapping. That, that was oh, an awesome okay. talk. You know, thank you, Joel, for um, bringing that whole history to us and especially, um, you know, bringing some of the history of University of Chicago to the fore. That was just an excellent talk. Thank you. It's, I, I don't think there's hyperbole to say that for those of you that are in Hyde Park right now, that at that site, that changed the world for everybody in ways that very, you know, and it did so at a particular moment in time. There's not a whole lot else that, you know, we're historians, we, we love to say that it's more complicated. Well, there's a lot of context, but it's, it's, it's one of the major moments in the 20th century. Chris Daugherty seems to have his hand up. I don't, am I supposed to be calling on people, Mark? Or you... Yeah, yeah. It, 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 I didn't, Chris? Hi, Joel. Yes, it's Chris. Hi. Um, you know, the, the, we've, some of us who've been here a long time have heard kind of intimate stories about a couple of folks that were here and even here into deep into the 20th century. And one of those folks was Leon Jacobson. Mm -hmm. You know, Leon was head of Hemonc and then chair of medicine and then the dean. And we've been taught these stories about how Jacobson was pulled off the floor as an intern and taken into a room and told that he would be responsible. He would be under direction from Dr. Stone and be responsible for examining the physicists and technicians. And the presumption was that he had access to the isotopes, to the plutonium, and he was one of the ones that was actually injecting patients, doing some of those radiation experiments. But that was never, never kind of revealed. We, our earliest history of Jacobson is about the discovery and administration of nitrogen mustard for cancers, including Hodgkin's disease. That's where his story starts. Do you, and, and then, you know, there was the advisory committee's report back in the 90s about the human radiation experiments and the ethical issues about, you know, could those data be used and do we use the same standards of informed consent today as we should have then? I just, do you have any knowledge about 
some of the individual players um, opposed to the institutions themselves to you? You know, to get to drill down to that, the, the advisory committee has a wonderful website in which they have a ton of archival materials. Um, that's where I would go if you to see what, you know, pr precisely what role Jacobson played. There are also the archives over in special collections in Regenstein that would probably have a lot of that of that information. Yeah, I, I do not. I, I do not know. I have, the question, I don't know. St apparently Stone's archives are there such as they are, but I was told quite honestly by public relation years ago that when it was announced uh, that there was going to be this investigation, a lot of Jacob's archives were actually picked up and moved to some, some more confidential site. That wouldn't surprise me. Um, when the reports came out, a lot of institutions, including the University of Michigan, look specifically at what happened at their place. And that's what that's certainly one approach to doing the history. I think it's, I was trying to give a sense more that said this stuff was going on um, all over yeah. the place. Yeah. I would also say as a historian, and I know there's at least one or two other historians on this call or were earlier. Um, when somebody tells you, this is, I was there, this is what happened. You say, thank you very much. I understand that's your memory of what happened. Uh -huh. And that's very useful information. Uh, I don't want to take the time, but there are innumerable examples of people who just remember things differently than the uh -huh. solid archival. I mean, over the passage of time, we all rework our memories. I mean, the, the way you treated your siblings growing up, I'm sure that you don't, you know, they would remember it differently. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay. Beware, beware of I remembered this. I want to see the, I want to see the archives. Yeah. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thanks so much. Say one, I just want to say one thing to piggyback on that. Deb Werner put um, a link. Deb Werner, who's our um, biomedical librarian and super sleuth extraordinaire, put a link to the Jacobson papers at the U of C Special Collections. And I remember reading in an article either something about him. He wrote this great book from Adam to Eve, A T O M to Eve, about. Uh, his experience, it'd be interesting to sleuth that because I think that's absolutely fascinating. Um, and, you know, as you were saying, Joel, the whole, you know, the first cancer center at the U of C was actually a partnership, you know, with the Atomic Energy Commission. And there's great pictures in the special collections of all the, you know, um, radioisotopes in the floor and pictures of, you know, Leon Jacobson and, um, uh, who was the other guy whose name is um, Robert Stone? Prosser, yeah, and Stone, and all these guys. There's great pictures, actually. The special collections is a real treasure trove. It'd be fun to plumb that and see. I'm just looking at the finding aid the, right now. I see there are 98 boxes. And so, <laughs> well, a lot depends upon how carefully, you know, how accurately it's organized. Um, and knowing the special collections of Regenstein, I've worked there, it's probably very well organized, uh, and how much material is still there, but that's worth a look. It's so a those of you, right? For those of you who are there, hey, you know, if you're, if you're even minimally interested, go take a look. I mean, the, the bug, it, it is really fascinating to look through the original archival material. All you got to do is let them know you're coming and say you want to look at these three folders, and they'll pull them out. Um, I mean, obviously I love it. It's what I do for a living, but I would suggest that anybody who thinks they might love it should give it a shot. Can I jump in? <laughs> Please, yes. Always. Hi there. Um, thank you so much for that talk. I'm, I'm curious um, maybe to hear you say a, few, a little bit more about this retrospective ethical judgment that came up in the President's Commission, if you wouldn't mind, you know, elaborating on that. But I think the bigger question, maybe relative to that for me is um, really how you're thinking about a history like this, which is so sort of horrific and extreme um, in relation to like normative judgment. I mean, what, uh, how does a commission look at a history like this and, and really sort of move forward in some productive way toward, you know, a normative set of, of you know, policies or recommendations? Um, I'd love to hear you reflect on that. Do we have two or three weeks to get yeah, started? Go ahead. <laughs> um, that's obviously a, it's it's a really good question. It's 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 the key question. Um, 
and I'm going to be provocative here and, and probably um, irritate two thirds of the people on the call and suggest that by and large, most norms are cultural and social and ethical. And that is to say that it's, it's, it's really hard to come up with, with standards that cross all cultures and all time periods. And that's what the historic, the President's Commission tried to do. Um, the, you, you run into what people sometimes pejoratively you refer to, you know, relativistic medical ethics. Um, I mean, it's bad to kill people. I mean, there's, actually, there's, there's a trial going on just north of you right now about whether or not you're justified in killing people. And I will let, I will restrain myself. I have very strong opinions about that particular series of events. Um, on the other hand, you don't want to go say anything goes. And so one of the things the President's Commission looked to and said is, are there written standards or accepted standards? If everybody agreed you shouldn't do something and you did it, then you're transgressing an ethical norm. And that's why the coded comment I made about the, the memo that said you need to get consent from volunteers in 1942. Um, but if it's a secret memo, is it, you know, how do you think about that? Um, the they did say that using people purely as a means to an end is they they viewed as being unethical at all at all levels um you know i think it's an interesting question to, and it, it's 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 so good i'm not trying to duck it it's just that it's it, it gets unless, unless you want to believe that you have access to some set of ethical norms that transcends all cultures times and beings and you'll tell us what it is, and if we don't abide by it, then we're being unethical. Um, that is an approach that one could take. I would not support such an approach. That's I mean, helpful, thank you. So the, 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 the retrospective aspect of that commission was aimed at trying to get, trying to think about the, the norms that would have or should have been present at that time, as opposed to sort of saying, well, after the fact, we're, we're gonna decide that that was wrong or something. And they were specifically aimed at who 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 deserve money, who should be who should be paid paid judgment, mm -hmm. and um, they didn't. They, for the Fernal group came up, they, they they thought they deserved some some financial recompense. I forget exactly who got it. There weren't there weren't a whole lot of people who they thought they didn't deserve to be paid money. Thank you, Joel, I have a very strange question to ask. Um, Give me a strange answer. <laughs> with regard to that December of 1942 um, self-sustaining nuclear reaction that was done in, in the squash court, um, I've often been concerned about how much knowledge they had on whether there was an ability to stop such a nuclear reaction from continuing and extending. I, I mean, destroying the, the community and the, and the, and the university. Um, was, was there any work in advance of, of, of that, that procedure um, that, that gave them a, an idea that, that it would be, that, that it would have the ability to stop it? They thought really hard. They wrote, they wrote a bunch of equations, um, but they didn't know. And in terms of informing the community, again, we're, we're in the middle of a world war. And, um, you know, Ger Germany is busy bombing central London every chance they get. And I don't think anybody doubts that if they had a nuclear bomb, they would have dropped it in the middle of central London. And uh, if they knew what we were finding, then they would be more inclined to keep working because they would believe that it was possible. So the, the quote that I gave you, which I love, that's from, um, I didn't tell you, it's, it's a Hungarian physicist who was very involved in the work. You know, he was not sure if that was going to be the end of everything. And again, when they, when they actually had the first atomic bomb, they didn't know what it would do to the space-time continuum and would it spread all around the world. And I not so theoretical way during the Cold War, we uh, we had so many we, we were running out of targets in the Soviet Union and they were running out of targets in the United States and the joke it wasn't a joke 
But the line was that the bombs were just going to make the rubble bounce up and down. And this is something that could have that could have gone on a hair trigger because with mutually assured destruction, if you think they're about, if you think they've just launched a bunch of missiles at you, you've got to launch your missiles or you lose the ability to respond. Um, yeah. But specifically, I don't know. I don't. I don't think they. I don't think they did any. I don't think anybody ever thought of warning the community. I don't think that was even on their radar screen. They were trying to win the war. Thank you. Um, there's a hand up from, and I don't know how to pronounce, a seal. A seal, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my question is um, with respect to the presidential commission. Does it only, uh, was it established with the purpose of um, investigating and looking into previous war cases, or is it um, geared towards past and possibly current war situations? And I would like to specifically know if there has been any studies into the Gulf War, the Gulf War syndrome that veterans suffered from during the 1991 war. And if the monetary compensation that was set aside by the commission covers both compensation to the veterans as well as um, subsequent or future research to investigate this disease. Thank you. Um, the purpose of the commission was specifically the human radiation experiments. And I do not know about other commissions set up to explore experiments or, or uh, issues related to the Gulf War. I know there was investigations looking at the Vietnam War. Uh, but this particular commission was focused on the human radiation experiments. Uh, again, coming out of the work done by Eileen Wilson and also uh, either Senator or Representative Markey uh, of Congress who chaired a committee that also looked into the same, the same questions. Jay, did you want to go? Yeah, sure. Thank, thank you. Um, uh, thank you for this for this talk. This is a really really interesting uh, history that you've sort of outlined here. Um, I'm thinking thinking in the sort of context of of our current time. Obviously, the we're not in the Cold War anymore, but the most sort of pressing sort of like you know foreign policy thing that is uh, or national security issue is obviously the war on terror, um, where there's a similar kind of uh, there's often a similar kind of, of, of angst and even perhaps willingness to override, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, particular rights of human, of human beings, soldiers, soldiers, prisoners of war, uh, what have you for this, for this, you know, uh, admittedly, uh, uh, dif uh, diffuse sense of, you know, uh, of the nation's security. And, um, now, some of that is not is not direct. I'm I'm not aware of any sort of uh, relations to that with medical research. So I wouldn't have no, uh, been aware of much of this if we were if we were going if uh, you know this was we were talking about this in 1950. Um, but I'm curious how do you feel confident that given the sort of regulations that are in place now that this sort of thing that this certain this kind that, that similar sorts of uh, experiments wouldn't be uh, replicated in uh, sort of our current time or something similar? Curious absolutely, ab absolutely not. Okay. To answer your question, um, you know, let's take a look at some of the regulations. Hmm. Uh, sorry, I'm getting a little feedback. Um, IRBs, as you may know, came directly out of the Tuskegee experiments, right? The Tuskegee experiment started in 1932, run by a bunch of scientists in the public health service. If they, if you had convened an IRB in 1932, do you really believe they would have not allowed the Tuskegee experiments to go forward? No, okay, they, they were, there was the, the, the people who have been running them were the same people that were doing the experiments. Similarly, these days, I, you know, we have, I think very, very weak, uh, constraints on the uneth unethical prom promulgation of experiments. And I think national security uh, could very easily be used to justify, well, I mean, look, at, it's already been used to justify all kinds of stuff. I mean, look at the, 
unless you think torture is is a valid way of us performing our tasks, which I do not. Um, you know, it's not that long ago, and and you know, if you want to believe that it would never happen again, that's fine. But I, I don't have that same kind of confidence. Does that answer your question? Am I confident it will never happen again? No. Yeah, I guess my my sort of follow up is um, is you know thinking about one one of the sort of one of the sort of uh, would think one of the sort of levers as far as like policies is the is the kind uh, of the sort of like secrecy that takes that is sort of overriding as sort of uh, under which these experiments took place. Um, and obviously, as you as you meant as you mentioned, you know, we're not the current the our current environment might not might not involve sort of uh, uh, medical experiments under under secrecy, but you know, black sites uh, uh, sort of. Uh, where all manner of things take place underneath them um, could still very well be uh, could still very very much used, and so the sort of the the hope that this that this wouldn't happen again uh, is is probably is probably not a very uh, is a sort of a is a, is a hope. It's not exactly a confidence. Yeah, the one thing that is different, um, and I think I'm right on this. I, I, this, I had. That I think there was more of an apocalyptic fear about ex existential threats to 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 widespread existence uh, during the Cold War. Um, I mean, people really did have fallout shelters, and um, you know the the the, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis brought us very very close to entering into an exchange of nuclear weapons. Uh, there's Abel Archer. I just tell us anybody. Abel Archer is the name of a um, exercise that we ran. I believe it was 1983 across the uh, ocean with Russians, in which they sincerely believed we were getting ready to launch a surprise attack on them, and they were getting ready to to preemptively launch an attack on us. Um, there's a fair amount of literature on this. I've written one paper about it. Um, so we've come very very close, and and. and you know, if, if we get into a, a nuclear war with, with even today with Russia, it's, I mean, our, our world is done and their world is done and most of the world is done. Um, but there was very much, there was much more of a, something that was on people's minds and that you thought about when you went to school. I mean, can you imagine being taught in elementary school? You know, you know, if, the, if you see the flash of an atomic weapon, what you should do is drop down into a culvert and look away. I mean, this, this was real. This is what we were being taught. We're, we're not quite there now. <laughs>